Turn on your inner light show. It's time to stop just surviving, and it's time to begin to thrive. It's time to live happier and healthier. Turn stress into strength. Noted author Debbie Mandel will show you how to move beyond personal doubts and fears and into positive perception to turn on your inner light. Here's your host, Debbie Mandel. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to my show. Our guest expert is Stan Goldberg, Ph.D., a hospice volunteer and caregiver, therapist, clinical researcher, professor, and author of Leaning Into Sharp Points. Do you know what to expect when dealing with challenging life and death experiences? Welcome, Stan. Well, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be on your show. Thank you so much. That's very kind. Now, you define caregiving in terms of a relationship. I always thought of it as a one-way street. Yeah, and I, I think that's the problem with many people who are caregivers, and that is their, the assumption is that they're going to be giving constantly. And, you know, we're, we're not, our DNA is not constructed to be 24-7 caregivers. And, and I don't know anybody who's a Mother Teresa, and probably not even Mother Teresa is a Mother Teresa. But it's, it's a relationship in which the person who is caring for another individual does give, but through that experience, they receive things that are unimaginable through any other experience. Well, like what? Well, to, just to know that someone is totally dependent upon you for their existence is very humbling. Um, when someone is very ill, they have a, a honesty that I've never seen in any other situations where, you know, to, to be at the receiving end of that, to have someone tell you how much they appreciate what you're doing or how much they love you, you know that it's not contrived. They're not trying to, uh, to pretend anything. What they're saying is exactly what they're feeling. Well, let me play devil's advocate. What if the loved one has Alzheimer's? I mean, you're not getting much of the communication. Sometimes you get accusations. Sometimes you get violence. You may not get any verbal. Yeah, uh, what happens quite often as people become more ill, and especially with Alzheimer's, the means that they've used their entire life to communicate what they feel and what their needs are is gradually deteriorating. So with Alzheimer's, the ability to use abstractions goes you know, very quickly. And it's the same thing happens with other illnesses. So you're left with an individual who still has all of the same needs and desires they had before the illness, and they've lost the ability to communicate it. So what happens is they use the only means that are available. And often, um, when someone feels anxious or afraid of their, their future, it comes out in terms of anger or hostility or feelings that are misinterpreted as, as ingratitude towards the caregiver. But in fact, they're just expressing what they are feeling, but in ways that we still don't understand. But also, Stan, in this kind of disease, parts of the brain and synaptic connections dry up, so personalities are altered, uh, uh, where people might behave in strange ways or be locked into some extreme or something they never evinced before. Yeah, uh, that happens. And, and I think, you know, but in, in terms of trying to understand what an ill person is going through, I think it's important that we start with the premise is that they're having difficulty expressing their feelings. Now, that may not always be the case. I know that uh, when my brother-in-law uh, had a brain tumor, um, he had, you know, many delusions that were you know, just very bizarre, and they had nothing to do with with what he was feeling, and we were able to work those things through. But with many other people, um, you know, if if we start with the belief that they are delusional or they are just ingrateful, then it doesn't give us an opportunity to 
to address some of those real needs that are left unfulfilled. I like the way you phrased it in the book, that if you can't have compassion for your loved one, because whatever the stage is at this point, if their personality is altered or you've had bad baggage with that loved one, you can certainly cultivate understanding. And I think that's what you're trying to share with us at this point, and, and that's really good. So I want to clarify that. What does a loved one really need from the caregiver? I think, you know, it varies with each individual, just like each person had certain needs before they were ill, and they're never the same. But if there was one thing that I could say would be uh, a guideline, it would be acceptance and understand that the world of the person who is ill is substantially different than the world of the person who is caring for them. I mean, we all see our current lives through our history, and the history of someone who is ill is filled with many experiences related to the illness that involve the creation of a dependent relationship, and a loss of identity. So if a caregiver can keep those things in mind, regardless of the illness, regardless of the kinds of things they may not understand what's going on, I think it serves not only the person they're caring well, but also themselves. So let me take, give you an offshoot to this question. You know, many caregivers get depleted, uh, especially caring for someone with dementia. There's this chronic stress that sets in. How, what uh, advice or coping strategies can you give us for not resenting? Specifically, what can we do? Well, you know, I, I think it's interesting because I had to ask that question to myself when my wife had a stroke. Now, she recovered completely, but I was her uh, caregiver 24-7 for three months. And during that time, I experienced, I think I experienced, most of the, the highs and lows of, uh, of what most caregivers go through, ranging all the way from incredible compassion to feelings of resentment. Um, well, let's thought, hold that thought. I want to get back to you resenting your wife. That okay. sounds like reality TV, but we're going to go to commercial break and return with Dr. Stan Goldberg author of Leaning Into Sharp Point. Now you can take Debbie Mandel home with you. Her book, Turn On Your Inner Light, Fitness for Body, Mind, and Soul, will help you decompress with healthy, positive, concrete solutions. Common life challenges are presented so that you can quickly find the help you need. Emotional tips, original meditations, and a fun and easy-to-follow fitness workout for each mindset. This revolutionary new method will help you rewire mind and body to take back your power. Get it on Amazon. Are you overwhelmed with the burden of taking care of children, parents, or both? Are you taking care of everyone else except yourself? It's time to change your habits and re-energize. Debbie Mandel gives you an innovative and easy-to-follow program for good health and happiness. In her magical new book, Changing Habits, The Caregiver's Total Workout, Debbie Mandel shows you step-by-step how to find the optimal balance between giving and receiving and guides you to exercise and eat right to take care of yourself. What are you waiting for? Read Changing Habits and start training for your life. Life does not need to be a burden. Get Changing Habits, the caregiver's total workout on Amazon. Listening to the Turn On Your Inner Life Show. I'm your host, Debbie Mandel, and I'm speaking with Dr. Stan Goldberg, author of Leaning Into Sharp Points. Stan, before commercial break, you were telling us how much you resented your wife. Just I, I wouldn't put it quite that way, Debbie. <laughs> I, I, what I did resent was having to give up things because she was ill. And I think that's very different than resenting the person. 
the problem that, that caregivers have most, it most often is with the illness, not the individual. Um, and, and I think that it's a very important distinction for caregivers to make that you, you can resent the illness and the changes that it have caused in your life, but that shouldn't carry over to resenting the person you're caring for because in most cases they had nothing to do with it. They're not to blame. That's a very good distinction. What I also liked in the book was the practical advice about bedside etiquette. Could you give us a couple of examples? Yeah. Um, all, you know, in the book, there's over a hundred very specific practical things to do. And the reason each one of those was included was that I saw that it worked when I, as a hospice volunteer. And it works in two different ways. The first is it eases the suffering of the person you're caring for. And the second, it simultaneously will reduce the duration and the severity of the grief you will feel after your loved one dies. Now, they range uh, from really something very simple, such as sitting next to a loved one when you're talking rather than standing. Now, it, it seems you might say, well, why? What difference does that make? The physical distance between a caregiver and a loved one is often translated by the, the loved one into a psychological distance. So if I'm sitting when I'm talking to my wife, either on the bed or on a chair next to her, that sends a very different message than if I'm standing over her like most physicians do in hospitals and talking down to her. So that's the very, you know, the easy things. The most difficult one is giving permission for a loved one to die. And um, it's the final gift a caregiver can, can give to a loved one. And it's, it's a very difficult process you know, to go through. But in that range, from sitting to giving permission to die, I mean, there's over a 100 very specific things caregivers can do. I thought your book was practical, but also very touching. And having been a caregiver twice, I learned so many things that, I, that really surprised me. It showed me how immersed you were. So let me ask you about this point that you brought up. You wrote about hospice doctors, and we made this obvious point, which I should have considered. They don't get accolades for saving lives here. How truthful should they be, and can we make them more truthful? Well, you know, I think I, I have many friends in, uh, in the hospice community who are very adamant that everybody should be told uh, of, of a terminal diagnosis. And my view is somewhat different. I want to have a, a, a uh, an honest discussion with my physician if it comes to that. I have prostate cancer, and you know my physician knows that you know I need to be on top of everything that's happening. But that isn't true for for everybody. In some cultures, uh, it's difficult to accept the end of life, and there's certain customs that are used for that. For me, the advice I give in the book is you need to first know and understand your loved one's uh, beliefs and, uh, and their desires. Um, if you know that, then you, you are in a position of, of making that determination. The, one of the problems that often occurs is that we really don't talk about end-of-life issues until we're in a situation that need that we need to talk about it, and I think that is uh, a crisis in uh, in most cultures. Is that looking at issues involving death and dying um, are put off to the side as if they had nothing at all to do with living. And the more we do that, the more often we get into these concerns of should I tell my loved one about terminal diagnosis. And you know, as you speak to me now, it truly resonates. And I'm thinking we're all terminal. <laughs> so why not get things clear and our wishes at this point? That doesn't mean our wishes won't change. I tell my kids, you know, when the time comes, don't pull the plug while I'm napping. <laughs> don't be in a rush to do it. 
you had a, a very interesting section on what to do when the conversation turns silent. Yeah, um, what, what, one thing that I've I've witnessed more often than I would like to is when a patient um, of mine or or someone that I'm counseling is sitting with relatives. And the assumption, you know, when, when there's silence, the assumption by the visitor is they need to fill that silence with words. And, and I've seen it very often where the person who is dying wants to talk about certain things. And, you know, it's not, it's not at the level of will the Giants win the World Series. It's looking at such significant parts of their life that they need time to compose that. So when, when you, you're in a situation where it appears that there's just silence, you don't need to fill it with words. Give the, your loved one enough time to compose and, and tell you what's on their mind. I thought that uh, this piece of advice is also reassuring that sometimes things are communicated without words. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's a touch of the hand or a look in the eye, and, and, and it's understood, or love is transmitted. So I think that's very powerful. We could use that in our normal conversation exchanges, and I, that's a point well taken for me. Well, we go to commercial break to fill our silence, and we will return with Dr. Stan Goldberg, author of Leaning Into Sharp Point. Dear listeners, I'm excited to tell you about my new book, Addicted to Stress. This is a message you need to hear. Are you addicted to stress? Do you do it all while everyone depends on you? Where's all this pressure coming from? It is coming from inside you. This is why my publisher, John Wiley, asked me to write Addicted to Stress, a woman's seven-step program to reclaim joy and spontaneity in life. This fun-to-read book teaches proven strategies to reclaim your life, silence your inner critic, build a healthy body, and reframe your thoughts to change your life for the better. Dare to be happy without the guilt. Addicted to Stress is easy to get. It's available at Barnes & Noble and other fine bookstores everywhere. You can also buy it at Amazon and other online retailers. back with Dr. Stan Goldberg, author of Leaning Into the Sharp Point. Now, Stan, you wrote about the role of predictability. So how do you achieve that for a loved one? You don't. Um, and, and I think that that's the, the, the bottom line of that section, is that, you know, every day when we're not ill, uh, we live our life according to what we know from our past. You know, I know when I buy an apple, it'll taste sweet. Uh, and that'll happen today, tomorrow, or in a month from now. When someone is chronically or terminally ill, that sense of predictability is stripped away. Uh, because it's, it's, especially with a terminal illness, because it's always advancing. And as it advances, what it does, it not only changes physically how someone is feeling, but it changes emotionally as well. And it's very difficult getting any sense of balance or regularity or predictability in that situation. Um, what I think is best is for caregivers to remain nimble, not to expect the kind of reaction yesterday that a loved one has will be the same today or tomorrow. And it's almost as if you know, to, to use a, a Buddhist phrase, you're really living in the moment because the moment for someone who is ill continually changes. I think that's very wise. Uh, when my mom had Alzheimer's, I learned to live in the moment. I learned to let go because 
the moment was all we had. She didn't remember the previous moment. And that actually transferred into a life lesson. Mm -hmm. And to, so that Zen concept of being present and aware. Now, you also, by the same token, expressed how we need to help our loved ones learn new behaviors. Yeah. Um, what, you know, what, what happens quite often as someone gets more ill is their identities change. Uh, someone who was highly independent, uh, this, this actually, this was a, an individual that I cared for who was the CEO of a major corporation. Um, and he had a form of cancer. And as his cancer progressed, um, he needed to depend more and more on other people. And that was a very difficult thing for him to do. So one of the things that I, along with his wife, had to do was to help him accept the fact that he really was changing and therefore some of his behaviors, like always insisting on doing things by himself, had to change along with that. So it, it's more of an attitudinal direction that you want to help a loved one take rather than a specific, you know, teaching them a specific behavior. I also like the practicality that you presented of having sort of a schedule mm -hmm. so that the loved one can know, all right, this is what we do now. And even if it's just one thing every day, it restores, I think, a kind of normalcy. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, we, we know, we know the problem exists with Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia where the ability to structure the world around us for the person who has Alzheimer's is rapidly deteriorating. So what had been um, familiar yesterday might be frightening today. The Someone who doesn't have any kind of cognitive deficits have built into them internally the sense of organization, the certain rules that we use in order to, to you know, interact with everybody. If those internal rules and structures aren't there... Well, and again, I, I have to, at this point, be a little bit abrupt, and you're so kind, and you're such a giving person, but our time together has flown by. I deal with the chronic stress management angle, and you have given us the inside story. Now, can we learn more about the inside story of caregiving from yeah. you? Uh, I have a website, and it's Stan Goldberg Writer, W-R-I-T-E-R dot -E com, all one word, Stan Goldberg Writer dot com. And on that website, I have over 90 articles on um, loss, end-of-life issues, illness, recovery, joy, and they're all free, and anybody just can go on the, the site and download any of the articles. Well, thank you so much for being a great teacher and someone who's gotten his hands immersed in it, so we trust your authenticity. Be well. Thank you very much, Debbie. Bye-bye. Affirmation of the week. Worry often gives a little thing a giant shadow. And now for the latest medical trends. Older drivers rated at high crash risk on computerized vision tests are more likely to have driving problems related to distractions in the car. Negative thinking is a red flag for clinical depression. Stopping such thoughts early on can save millions of people from mental illness, according to a research study from Case Western Reserve University. Narcissism, a trait considered obnoxious in most circumstances, actually pays off big time in the short-term context of a job interview, according to a new study from the University of Nebraska. If you're looking for a job, try a bit of narcissism. Eating foods at breakfast that have a low glycemic index may help prevent a spike in blood sugar throughout the morning and after the next meal of the day, according to the Institute of Food Technologists. 
greater lifetime exposure to the stress of traumatic events was linked to higher levels of inflammation in a study of about a thousand patients with cardiovascular disease from the University of California. And with trees blooming earlier and more pollen in the air, allergy sufferers are feeling earlier symptoms, nasal congestion, sneezing, eye itching, and, and watering. This is from allergist Stanley Feynman, the American College of Allergy. And uh, if you are feeling these symptoms, you are not alone. Take measures to keep yourself in balance and stay out do, uh, indoors during peak allergy time. I go outdoors into the battle of the beast. Well, we come to the close of another show. I have an educational website on stress management, totally free. Turn on your inner life.com. All the radio shows with the guest experts are archived for your listening pleasure. You can click on them and they go right into YouTube at turnonyourinnerlife.com. Subscribe to my free newsletter at turnonyourinnerlife.com and you will get the latest stress management article the most noteworthy radio show of the week, and the Health Tips Fully Delineated email directly to you. Have a wonderful week and see you on the radio.